I want to introduce our amazing moderator tonight. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce Por Chista Kakpor. Um, she was born in Tehran in 1978, an infant of the Islamic Revolution and a toddler of the Iran-Iraq War. Her debut novel, Sons and Other Flammable Objects, was a New York Times editor's choice, Chicago Tribune Falls Best, and a 2007 California Book Award winner. Her second novel, The Last Illusion, won a place on a number of best of lists, um, including Kirkus, BuzzFeed, and NPR. Um, she also has a memoir coming out really soon that I hope you'll all stay tuned for. It's called Sick, um, and she'll celebrate the launch of that book with us here in, on June 6 with the incredible Yian Lee. So come back for that. Um, she's a longtime friend of the workshop, and we're really honored to have her here tonight. So please give Poor Chista a warm welcome. Hi, welcome to Asian American Writers Workshop. It's so exciting that so many of you are new. This is such a special place for so many of us in New York over a very, very long period of time. And it's also, I always very much thank them for recognizing Iranian Americans too and remembering that we are West Asian and uh, deserve to be part of this beautiful um, term, Asia. So um, thank you for coming. I apologize, my whole condition, I have late stage Lyme disease, which is what my memoir is about too, so this is why I'm dropping things all over the place and all that, but in the midst of a Lyme relapse. But I'm tremendously honored to be here today and to be with these wonderful, wonderful, talented writers um, and translator. Uh, so I'm not gonna say too much in the beginning, I'm just gonna do the intros and then they're each gonna read a little section and then I'll speak a little bit and we'll have some questions and then we'll turn it over to you guys. So if you have questions percolating in the back of your head, start thinking about them and don't be shy. I always think that's the part where you entertain the readers. Um, you know, we come here and, you know, we do our thing, but it's always lovely to have people interact with us in that way too. And Asian American Writers Workshop always gets great questions, so go for it. Okay, so first, first of all, I'm, I have the great honor of introducing Jasmine Darznick. So I'm gonna read her bio and then I'll talk a little bit about that after. Um, Jasmine Darznick is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Good Daughter, a memoir of my mother's hidden life. Her novel, Song of a Captive Bird, is a fictional account of Iran's trailblazing woman poet, Furul Farouk and will be published by Random House in February 2018. So it just came out. Um, to tremendous acclaim, so, uh, and it's available for sale, yeah, and we're so lucky to be, to hear from it. Um, Jasmine was born in Tehran, Iran, and came to America when she was five years old. She holds an MFA in fiction from Bennington College and a PhD in English from Princeton University. Now a professor of English and creative writing at California College of the Arts, she lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her family. So please, round of applause for Jasmine. Pleasure to be. No, it's not on. No. Where is it? Okay. Um, such a pleasure to be here. I had the wonderful fortune of coming here when my first book came out, and as Porjista mentioned, I feel so lucky that um, the Asian American Writers Workshop recognizes Iran and Iranian writers. I think we both. We all feel so supported by that. And then particularly, it's just amazing uh, company tonight. Shahri Armandanipur, I've taught his work. I am um, just honored to be in his company, let alone reading alongside him and his wonderful translator, Sara Khalili. And um, Purchista, who is, um, you know, she's really, she's someone I admire so much. She was probably the first um, novelist who, she just broke so many barriers with her, um, with her first novel, Sons and Flammable Objects, and she's just continued to impress ever since. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to read from my novel. It was decided we're going to read from the couch, so I feel like it's a little bit like story time at the library. <laughs> um, I'm going to read from Song of a Captive Bird, which is my recent novel. It came out a couple months ago. 
And as Porchista mentioned, it's a novel about Iran's, I would say she's one of Iran's most famous women poets. Certainly, I'd call her the most notorious woman poet, Furu Farouksad, uh, who was born in 1935 and died in 1967. The novel includes translations of Furu's poems. So the section I'll read to you, I'm going to read to you from the very beginning of the book. And the first lines that I'll read to you are actually lines from, from a poem of Furuk's. So if you hear something especially beautiful, that's, that's Furuk <laughs> and not me. Okay. There's a street where the boys who were once in love with me, the boys with tousled hair and lanky legs, still think about the innocent girl who was carried away by the wind one night. It was the end of my girlhood, though I didn't know it yet. If I realized what would happen there, would I have followed my mother to that room in the bottom of the city? If I'd guessed the purpose of our visit, would I have turned to run before my mother struck the brass knocker against the door? I doubt it. I was 16 years old and by anyone's account already a troublemaker, but in those moments that my sister and I stood under the clear blue sky of Tehran's winter, I understood nothing about what would soon happen to me and I was much too frightened to break free. It was morning just after 10 o'clock and the streets were crowded with people, many of them women on their way to the bazaar for the day's provisions. At the bakery, the line snaked around the building and into an alleyway. Men carried trays of flatbread on their heads. A boy hustled down the street with two huge earthenware jugs. We traveled, my mother, my sister, and I, in silence, turning off the main thoroughfare and onto a street that I didn't recognize. The wheels of the carriage creaked and groaned, and all the landmarks I knew disappeared until nothing was familiar anymore. After maybe a mile or so, we eventually passed a railway station. Here, the sharp clap of the horse's hooves against the concrete gave way to the soft thud of packed dirt, which is how I knew we were now in the southern section of Tehran, the city's poorest district. The streets turned shabby, and each corner we passed, each mosque, each row of houses and shops seemed dingier than the one before. Whole families crowded around dung fires, rubbing their hands over, the f over flames to keep warm. At the doors of a mosque, mothers stood with babies strapped to their chests, begging for alms as their children played at their skirts. Men slumped along the walls of houses while older children milled about barefoot in the streets. Beggars, puddles, rubbish, stray dogs. I couldn't tear my eyes away from any of it. Nobody I knew ever came to this part of the city, so I wanted to see everything, and I wanted to understand. At an intersection, we came to an abrupt halt while a man led two donkeys through the street. All the houses here had mud walls and mud walls and sloping tin roofs, and the roads were rutted with bumps. This area was called the bottom of the city, but it wasn't until much, much later that I learned that name. Are you sure that you'll be all right, madam, said the driver when the buggy jerked to a stop. My mother seemed nervous, but she nodded and quietly handed him the fare. As I stepped from the coach and into the lane, a strange order, odor assailed me, a mixture of mud, manure, smoke, and all at once I felt clammy and weak-kneed, and I reached for my sister's elbow to steady myself. From the end of an alley came the sharp barking of dogs, and black plumes rose from the rooftops, smudging the bright January sky. I followed my mother and sister a few paces, then stopped and planted my hands on my waist. Why are we here? Where are we going? It's a clinic, my mother answered. She spoke quietly, and now she too avoided my eyes. For God's sake, just hurry up, Furu. I was confused, but I relaxed a little. The pain in my arm had worsened in the night, and my lower lip was swollen and throbbing. I'd be grateful for some pills to ease the soreness. I gathered my veil around me, clasped it more tightly under my chin, and then followed my mother and sister down the lane. When we reached the last building, my mother gripped the edge of her veil with her teeth to free her hands and then reached for the brass knocker. She banged on the door. She banged again. After a moment, it opened, a crack. 
The vestibule was full of women. They stood in pairs and in groups, older women and several very young ones, from one end of the wall to the other. They waited with their heads tipped down, biting their lips, staring at the floor. No one spoke. A worn, faded carpet had been strung up from the ceiling as a makeshift partition between the vestibule and the rest of the building. After some minutes, a girl of 16 or 17 drew back the carpet and led us down the corridor and into a cramped chamber lit by two small kerosene lamps. The air here was laced with a strong, bitter scent. Ammonia, I guessed. I squinted, scanned the room. There was a square window set up high up in the wall and barred with a metal grate. Against one wall stood a table draped with a white cotton sheet. I glimpsed a wash basin in the furthest corner etched with brown lines. The walls were bare, but as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw that on one side of the room, a crack reached from the floor to the ceiling in a single long jagged line. I looked at my sister, but she still wouldn't meet my eyes. Was it then, in that moment, that I began to understand why we had come to this place or rather, why I had been brought here. Maybe, but by this time it was already too late. The door opened and a stout older woman entered. She had a sharp chin and she wore her hair parted in the middle and pulled into a low bun. She shut the door, issued a quick greeting, looked from me to my sister and then to our mother. Which one? she asked. My mother nodded in my direction. I watched as my mother and sister were ushered away. The younger woman stayed behind, standing with her arms clasped together in front of her. Sit, the older woman ordered once they'd left, motioning to the table. Take off your underpants and then lie down, she said. With my mother and sister gone, her voice was suddenly much harsher. My underpants? She nodded. I shook my head. I won't. The two women exchanged a look. That look, I would never forget it, or my own fear in witnessing it. I tried to stand, but before my feet reached the ground, the younger woman had already stepped forward. She was slight, slender as a reed, but her grip was astonishingly strong. She shoved me backward, and in what felt like a practice gesture, jerked my legs up onto the table, dug her elbow into my chest, and cupped her hand firmly over my mouth. Lie still, the older woman told me. She pushed up her sleeves, drew in a deep breath. Then she yanked my underpants down to my ankles and placed one hand on each of my knees to force my legs open. Whatever else I'd later forget about these next minutes or only pretend to forget, I can tell you I fought her and hard. I pushed myself up onto my elbows and kicked my legs, but the younger one only bore Um, but the younger one only bore deeper into my chest with one elbow, then cupped a hand over my mouth to stifle my screams, and the older one held me by the ankles. Lie still, they told me, this time together. Working quickly, the older woman forced my knees apart again, thrust two fingers inside me, hooked them in the shape of a C. I jerked my legs back and kicked her, this time much harder, and that is when it happened, in that instant when I tried to free myself. All of a sudden, I felt a tearing pain, quick, deep, and I sucked in my breath. The woman drew her fingers from me and wiped them briskly with a cloth. Something gave her pause, and a deep crease sprang up between her eyes. You're a stupid girl, she said, looking into my eyes for the first time since she'd entered the room. I told you to lie still, and you didn't and now see what you've done. That's it, I'll stop right there. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, Do you want to still stay there? However you shine. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce our next two readers uh, together because they're gonna do a sort of special reading. Uh, it's, It's we're going to have a part in Farsi and then that translated in English. So I'm going to do them, then they can join us together. It's a, it's a great treat for you all. 
Um, I was hoping for it, but I didn't know if it was going to happen. But uh, first is, is, is Sara Khalili is an editor and translator of contemporary Iranian literature. Her translations include Shahriar Mandanipur's great censoring an Iranian love story, The Pomegranate Lady and Her Sons by Qoli Tariqi, The Book of Fate by Parinush Sanayi, The Rit Rituals of Restlessness by Yaqub Yadali. She's also translated several volumes of poetry by Farooq Farah Saad, Simin Behbani, Siavash Kasrayi, and Feridun Moshiri. Her short story translations have appeared in the Kenyan Review, the Virginia Quarterly Review, Epic, Granta, Words Without Borders, the Literary Review, Pen America, Witness, and Consequence. And then we'll have with her, of course, Shahriar Mandanipur, one of Iran's most accomplished writers, the author of nine volumes of fiction, one nonfiction book, and more than 100 critical essays. Born in 1957 in Shiraz, Iran, he studied political science at Tehran University and bore, the uh, and, and bore witness to the 1979 revolution. After the onset of the Iran-Iraq War in 1980, he joined the military and volunteered for duty at the front, where he served for more than 18 months. His first collection of stories was published in 1989. His works were banned between 1992 and 1997. In 2006, he moved to the United States and has held fellowships at Brown, Harvard, and Boston College. Mandanipur's first novel to appear in English, Censoring an Iranian Love Story, which I also taught in Adore, um, that was Knopf, 2009, uh, has been widely acclaimed. Uh, he teaches creative writing currently at Tufts University. Okay, so if you could join us. Of course, I'm going to drop this. Um, thank you. Yeah, big round of applause for this team. So... Like we said, it's going to be a portion of the prologue by Shahriar in Farsi, and then we will have uh, Sara. مگر که دستم را پیدا کنم و رازش را نگاه کنم دستم بی امید چقدر تنها مانده دست چپم چقدر پوسیده و یتیم بدون تنم چقدر خوراک بارانها بادها و آفتابها شده چقدر روزه کشیده و تنم راهی صدا زده و من صدایش را نشنیدم تا حالا که من به هیچ چاره ای که هستم و هیچ نیستم جز همین یک بیچاری باید بروم که هستم باید بروم از دشت پاهای قد شده رد بشوم از دشت تانک های سوخته که لوله توپشان مثل معامله بعد از انزال شده رد بشوم تا برسم بالای آن کوهی که یادم نیست کجای کجا بود به کوفته شدم زمین و همانجا خونم ریخ زمین The scribe on his right shoulder writes, he thinks, I will have no relief or escape until I find my arm and discover its secret. My arm, alone for so long, my left arm, how decayed and orphaned, how long food for the rain, wind and sun, how long has it howled at and called out to me, and I have not heard it until now. Now I must go, I must cross the field of amputated legs and the desert of burned tanks with guns that resemble penises after ejaculation to reach the mountaintop where somewhere, I don't remember where, I was hurled to the ground and there my blood spilled on the earth. I know I must go to where God the all-forgiving kissed my arm, blessed my arm, and my arm fell and my hand rotted and worms were bo born from the feathers of angels' wings that had fallen to earth, and they fed on my flesh and turned the color of new feathers. And perhaps, if there still is a perhaps in the world, the remains of my arm have remained as white mutilated bones under the sun's blade or under the dirt where even the heavenly worms have abandoned them. I must deceive my fear and return to the mountain, to search from peak to peak, to gather the courage to touch the stone-hearted rocks and say, 
O oh, mountain rocks, you did not shelter my childhood sensation of touch with which I felt the carpet, the parrot's feathers, and my mother's face. Where is the sting of the principal's whip on the palm of my hand? Where is the snakeskin chill of the prayer beads? Where is the callus from thousands of pages of homework and the wetness from masturbation? Where is the cold touch of American grenades in my hand? O oh, wind of winds, winds of the mountain, where in time did you take the scent of the virgin girl's unripe breasts and the sweat of her unskilled waist that wrinkled on my hand? I will kiss the loco wheat's thorns and say, O oh, sacred thorns, pubes of the heavenly realm, why did you not scare away the corpse scavenging dogs so that they would not lick away the lines of destiny from the palm of my hand and leave me now, now at the end of the end, to beg, lay the corpse of my hand in my hand. I must see it and learn its secret, so that afterwards I may sit in peace on that same mountain top, and after all these years of yearning and wandering, I can at last take a quiet breath from my share of breaths, and with eyes dry or salty wet, I can gaze out at a foggy or sunny valley out there in the world and shout, Ahoy, I spit at all of you who have mired the world in filth. The scribe on his right shoulder writes, from the full-length window in Rehana's room, he looks out at the rainy, leafless garden, and it occurs to him. It's good that the second floor is always the second floor. He sees the fog wafting from the soil beneath the naked trees, a hesitant fog with a hint of violet. The sound of rainwater in the gutters of the old building grows louder. Rehane asks, how can it be that in your dreams you see nothing of the girl's face? I don't know, her face is hazy. Perhaps I see it, but it doesn't stain my memory. Maybe she has covered her face with a chador, I don't know. Sometimes I remember her hair, like a shadow. I think it's very long, all the way down below her breasts. I may have seen her naked, her hair covered her breasts. Hey, watch it. What? You're talking to your innocent, dewy-eyed sister. Don't play games with me, not you. What if there's a crescent moon on her forehead and it shines so bright that I can't see her face? This is all a tall tale. My dreams are not tales. In many of them, I see us putting rings on each other's fingers. So what, Rehana snickers? That's nothing. I dream that a prince comes to our house to ask for my hand in marriage and we get engaged. She stares at him warily and says, Maybe you had a bitter or painful experience that you subconsciously wanted to forget. That's what the idiot doctor at the nut house said, but I want you to help me remember. Tell me, what happened back then that could somehow be related to these dreams? How should I know? As far as I could tell, up until the day you went crazy and, and enlisted to go to war, you were always having fun with girls. I was wrong to say that you might have had a bad experience. In those days, you were too clueless to know the difference between a good experience and a bad one. And these are just dreams, nice dreams. I'm surprised they frighten you. I'm often frightened, and then I become even more frightened because I don't know what it is that I'm frightened of. Rehane's old samovar is gently simmering. He sees the fragrance of the 44 winter sweet bushes in the garden float toward the house like layers of dragonfly wings. Thank you, all of you. It's so beautiful to hear you read. And again, such a treat. This is a, a, a rare grouping here. So yeah. Um, I want to say a few words just to begin. I have a couple of my own questions, but I definitely want to have you guys speak a lot. Um, there's a lot that's been made of Iranian poetry, or you can say Persian poetry, of course, over like the decades and, and, and the centuries, really. Um, but oftentimes people forget to think about the Iranian novel. 
And so this is, I think, something we all here have in common, is that we have tackled the novel. Um, and I w I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that a little bit. I mean, there's, I've, I've definitely, it's not like the novel doesn't exist in Iran, but in a sense, it is a different sort of creature. And I don't think it's a coincidence that all of us on this panel in some ways work with hi what you might call hybrid forms. Um, this is pretty particular to all of them, whether it's um, you know, Jasmine uh, using uh, fiction and historical fiction, you could say, or actual like, uh, you know, you know, nonfiction, you could say, and weaving those back and forth, or Shahir and all his work going through multiple levels of the experimental, whether it's almost like narrative nonfiction, where there's complete fiction, where there's poetry, or all sorts of experimental forms. And I do think my personal feeling, and using those myself, is that it's some, there's something distinctly Iranian about that. Um, that to tell a story, we can't completely tell it straight. And so we have to tell it in many different ways and to cobble it from different entities always. And I think you could see that with this reading a little bit here. So I guess that's my first like, question that I want to turn over to you. If you think that what you did as writers itself had something Iranian in its project, or what do you think about this idea of the formal in your work too? Maybe we'll just start. With me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going alphabetical, but like anyone can chime in. Long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I, when I, one of my thoughts is that Furuk, who was writing in the 1950s, was really grasping for a form that felt fresh and modern and of the moment, and um, and her move was to free verse. So she had been raised, of course, reading Hafez and the great poets of Iran. But she felt that Persian, that the, that the literature she produced ought to have a kinship with the lived, um, the lived spoken speech of her day. And, um, and so uh, one of my challenges, or one of the tasks that I set for myself was to try to preserve that essence, even though I was working primarily, in, I was working in prose, but to bring her up to the current day, I suppose, and you know, give her a language that felt fresh to America in 2017 or so. Um, but I really am so intrigued. I, I think I really want to address this question of how Iranian writers can't tell a story straight. We have to sort of get, I come at it in, in an indirect way. Um, that's, I think that's so true. And my novel is enabled by the fact that there are so many gaps and erasures and silences in Furuk's story and in Iran's story too. If there had been more about this poet that I am writing about, I think um, I wouldn't have been able to write a novel about her. So those kind of evasions, you know, Iranians I feel like are particularly skilled at keeping secrets and keeping things <laughs> secretive. Um, I think those kinds of um, secrets were, to me, they were really energizing. I wanted to write right into those secrets and flesh them out with the truth that I couldn't tell through nonfiction. So I created, I hadn't thought of it like this, but a hybrid form as a way of addressing um, the, the ways that Furur has been mythologized but also erased in, in Iranian history. If you guys don't know her work too, sometimes annoyingly in, in, um, in, in the West, they talked about her as um, Iran uh, Sylvia Plath. And I often say, <laughs> Sylvia Plath was Furul Farahsad of the, you know, it's the opposite to me. But it's, it's, it's kind of a convenient, convenient story because people just look at both of these geniuses from the perspective of their tragedy. But there was a lot more to their lives. And of course, they both had, you know, didn't live long enough. We will always wish that they lived longer. But they quite, both of them achieved quite a lot in their short lives. And I think there was like, she's also, you know, many times when people ask me what my favorite writers are, you know, Furul Farahsad is one of my favorites too. She was my epigraph in my first novel too. It's, it's almost impossible for writers to not find uh, a great sense of pride. So I would encourage you guys to look uh, her up too. It's great to read her along with Jasmine's novel too. I mean, it's, it's Jasmine honors her beautifully in this. So, yeah. 
What do you guys think here? Do you have much to say on this issue of the hybrid form? Because I would say, you know, when I read your work first, which was initially censoring an Iranian love story, and then I attempted to read a lot of it in Farsi, but I failed oh, terribly because my <laughs> Farsi is not as good as it used to be. But I was really compelled by the idea of you as an experimental writer and the idea of someone who's obsessed with forms. And it felt so natural to me, and I think it was an influence on my own writing. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everybody for coming here. Uh, I used to tell my main idea in the second page, so <laughs> it's not late that I say thank you so much for coming and thank you for all of us, all of you. Uh, writing a novel, it is just for me, particularly when I was in Iran, it is just like walking on a minefield. Uh, there were times that when I was in front line against Saddam Hussein army, our sergeant, I was a, a lieutenant, lieutenant uh, our sergeant should go take a patrol close to Iran, Iraqis line and find out the ways, if there is a minefield or not. And they didn't go. So I wanted to support the life of my soldiers, so I went with them. They taught us how to walk in a minefield. Uh, <coughs> they call it uh, walking in a camel style. I don't know why. Uh, I would like to show it. Maybe sometimes you need it. <laughs> yeah, particularly when it is night. At night, you can't have any light. It is supposed that you touch the ground gently. And if you find out there is nothing there, then you can take a walk. It's not like uh, moonwalker, you know? <laughs> then the second step like it and then the third step but when I was there I tried to do it <coughs> but it takes so long <coughs> and we have just a few hours till uh, morning then at last everybody get tired of this kind of camel walking and started to walking let's go <laughs> the mind trip. This is the way that in Iran riders ride. I'm my uh, personal <coughs> experience. First of all, in your first publications, you are thinking about censorship, assassination, that I was a subject of one of them. And some sort of uh, suppression. But after <coughs> publishing your first book. At the first book, you are walking like a camera style. But at the second book, I said, OK, God damn it, let's walk. <laughs> and because of it, Iranian <coughs> contemporary literature, I think they did. My colleagues, my writers, my friends, they wrote and they were writing great stories and novels. Iranian literature is somehow endured because of censorship, because of assassination and something like that. But Iranian writers are keeping writing and writing and keep Persian language and Persian culture alive. Yeah, Sarah, I was going to turn that question to you, too, since you translate so many great Iranian writers, too. And perhaps you could say something about that in, in terms of also your process, too. Um, well, to start with Shariar's mm -hmm. work, since he used the minefield analogy, translating it is like hopping along a minefield. Um, what makes his approach to literature and students of his who are following his style is his experimentation with the language 
creates such intricate prose that, for instance, I, uh, we, we only read a small sp segment of the prologue, but uh, the entire prologue is very much poetry in prose. So basically translating it, I first have to unravel it in Farsi, translate it, then, if I may, re-ravel it into English to maintain the style, the tone, the music of it, and yet maintain his exact approach to the literary form. He experiments a lot with it, and I think it takes, for him, for any writer, I think it takes a lot of courage, it, especially given the nature of Iranian literature that is so steeped in tradition, in the classical form, for writers such as Shahriar to break barriers and just suddenly go left. Um, I, I think it takes tremendous courage and there's just amazing work as you can see that they produce, but then, you know, translating it, that's a whole different ballgame, <laughs> you know, but, it, but it's, I, I find it fascinating. Is your process similar with whoever you translate or is it? No, no. Um, I mean, with Shariot, the process is very challenging in that we work in tandem. He writes, I translate. I'm not given a finished work for me to then go read, digest, you know, appreciate, and then set out to translate it. We usually work in parallel. And what actually makes it a huge adventure for me is that I don't know how the story is going to end. I don't know what's happening next. I don't know this guy's a good guy, bad guy, he's gonna die, live, find his love, not find his love. So that, that keeps it really exciting for me. At the same time, it makes it a lot more difficult because you know a new character is introduced into the narrative and I don't know, is this a good guy, bad guy, you know, forming that character in the translation. So uh, I don't know, I think it, keeps things hopping, I would say. <laughs> oh, it's always exciting when you deal with Iranians in general. And, uh, Iranian <laughs> artists, you know, you'll never be bored. I can, I can, I can promise you that. Um, I have a question now for them, and then, and then I'm gonna, I promise I'm gonna turn it over to you guys because I, we, you're getting like five to 10 great answers and ones here with these brilliant minds. Um, Wondering what the inspiration was for you with these particular books, too. Jasmine, I wonder about, is, was, you know, I can imagine, like, myself, who was someone I has always been on my mind as an Iranian writer. Was it something that you always thought you were going to write, or was it, how did it come to you first? Well, I had, I had written one book that was, um, it was the story of my mother's life, and I was so enraptured by this period of time. I think many books that have been published in America about and by Iranians have circled around the period 1978, 79, because this is the moment that Iran becomes relevant to Americans. Yeah, um, but I was really so fascinated by the period 19, 1930, in 1935. The veil was outlawed in Iran. Many Americans cannot even imagine such a scenario, um, and there was this interval of time in which Iranian women were going to school and they were entering the professions and it was this, you know, some would say a, a too hasty entry into the, the 20th century so that my, my mother's life was totally unrecognizable um, to my grandmother in one generation. It had changed from my grandmother had maybe, she was actually completely illiterate. My mother became a midwife. Um, and um, and so that was a radical jump ahead. So I was really interested in this period because that interface of Islam and uh, modernity was happening at hyperspeed almost. And of course, that's the interface that we still, um, I think we still, it's our inheritance. That's, um, that's the interface that we see now under the Islamic regime. So... I'd, I'd say I was, I wanted to go back. I didn't want to leave, you know, and you know what it's like when you write a novel, you miss your characters or you miss your time. I really just wanted to live in Tehran in 1950. I don't know, it just, it really appealed to me so much. Um, and Furuk was the first person I thought of. I, I had read her in college and, and like Porchis is saying, she's so important to 
Oh, generations of Iranian women and men too. You know, Furugh is, we, when we came in 1978, my mom brought, she smuggled a book of Furugh's poems with her in her suitcase. She was that precious to my mother. And when I tell this story, a lot of, I've heard from other Iranians that when they came to America, they, that, that, was a, um, that was a book that they too had brought. And they certainly brought her with her in you know, less tangible ways. So, so it didn't take long to, to think about um, Furul. But I think, you know, as I was saying, it was, is also part of what was so fascinating about this project is that there were certain parts of the story. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not talking properly into this, I think. Um, the parts of the story were known. So as someone who was working for memoir, it was great because I was so afraid I wouldn't be able to think up a whole book, right? So, but I had certain parts of Furul's story I knew. She was born in, 19, uh, in 1935, and she was married in this year, and she was divorced in this year. And so it's sort of like a, a, a guardrail I could sort of grip onto. Um, and so it was a fantastic project for me, moving from memoir into fiction. And then in some ways, I think also it was just my, my, um, you know, my, my love letter to her. You know, she had been, for me, a revelation when I read her in college. I never knew Iranian women sounded like this. I never knew a Iranian woman could sound like this. And so, um, and also it was heartbreaking that Americans don't know her at all. I mean, if they ever know her, it's only as the Sylvia Plath of Iran, you know? Uh, and, so, um, and so maybe part of me was also thinking, here's this extraordinary woman, no Americans know about her. Well, you know, this is an opportunity to um, to share something really uh, precious and beloved to us Iranians with an American audience that knows so little about Iran. Sorry, long ago. Well, I'm just, I'm like hearing my dog faintly yelping in the background, so <laughs> that's the only thing. I'm like, Cosmo, be good. Okay. Um, Shahir, I wonder that also about Moonbrow, too. I mean, this was such a tremendous reading experience. I mean, like and unlike censoring an Iranian love story. I mean, this just took me into so many, many, many dimensions. And there's humor, and there's tragedy, and there's a little bit of everything. And of course, the things in your autobiography, like the Iran-Iraq war, I found to be so poignant. Um, where did this, did you plan to write this book? Was this a book you had written earlier? How did this, what was the inspiration for this one? The idea of the book uh, came to me when I was in Iran. Mm, it was fascinating for me and I started writing it. I think in, in, at the limited third person point of view. About 80 pages I have written and uh, write and I found out no, this novel is doesn't work. The narration is not working well. After a year, I started a new version of it, a new version of it, in first person point of view. And 60 pages, 50 pages, then I felt that, no, it's not the form of narration for this novel. And I think I was in Berlin in 2013. And suddenly, I was thinking about it, thinking, thinking about it. And at last, I got the idea of the form of narration, two angels, particularly in Islam. Uh, I believe that there are two angels sitting on the right shoulder and left shoulder. The right write the good things, good deeds, the left one, my lovely one, write the <laughs> bad things and <laughs> anti-Islam things and something like that. So then it goes easily when I started in this point of view and they pass it to each other. And there are times at the middle of the novel that they argue with each other as well. But the reality wasn't like what you're writing. And the other said, Somebody is uh, censoring us as well, I think. <laughs> and cleaning, uh, um, deleting something that I have written. And yeah, it goes very well. I didn't thought that this book would be about 450 pages. 
In my mind, it was 250. <laughs> but I write. <laughs> yeah. I write it in a sort of web page in the world. And so I couldn't find out how many pages it is. Then I send it to Sora. So I have a, a novel about 250 pages, and she made a contract with not only <laughs> the publisher, about 250 pages novel. And one day she called me. But do you know what did, what did you do? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> what did I do? 450 pages novel it is. I said, it's impossible. It's impossible. I'm not a writer to write so much like this. But it is, it was. <laughs> so I'm a feminist, and um, so I think I, got, I have such a right to make a sort of uh, joke about uh, translators. It is a, uh, a translation. <laughs> <laughs> translation is like a woman. I'm a feminist. Uh -oh. <laughs> If it would be beautiful in translation, it couldn't be faithful to the pro, to the text. If we wouldn't, if, if we try to be faithful, it couldn't be beautiful. I was so lucky, and I'm so lucky, that I found out the translation, translator, that she's beautiful and she is doing very well in this job. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's> a... <laughs> and so I always, always, I'm grateful to her. Yeah. That's why we t we always tell students to do one inch margins around and double space with serif fonts at twelve point because it's supposed to then reflect what it will look like actually in publication. <laughs> but you clearly broke that rule, <laughs> so you're not supposed to have, be surprised when it turns out to be double. Um, I know, gosh, that's a night, that's like every writer's nightmare. You're like, surprise, it's totally, yeah, another thing. Um, I want to, I want to pass, I have more questions, of course, I have 10 million things, but I want to make sure your voices get in there too. Questions for you all. You're going to be circulating some. Yes, we have one in the back. Thank you. <coughs> um, First of all, thank you for such a wonderful event. I'm so honored that you are all here. And for a scholar of Iranian and Iranian American literature, this is such an embarrassment of riches, I have to say. Um, and including, Porchi, so your first question, I'm working on a book about uh, hybrid genres in modern contemporary Iranian literature, so it couldn't be more, <laughs> more appropriate. Um, so my question is about travel. Um, and I want to try to make it apply um, to both of your works. Uh, Jasmine, I've been working, I'm doing a bit of work on Farooq's travelogues from 1956, uh, or travelogue singular, I should say. And it seems to me that um, when she goes to Europe for 14 months um, at the age of 21, um, there's a turn that happens in her poetry afterwards from sort of more personal and confessional, which, you know, not wanting to engage in the Sylvia Plath comparison, but personal, to much more political, like with Let Us Believe in the Beginning of the Cold Season and many other poems. Um, I wonder if you agree or if you have any other thoughts on how travel uh, that trip specifically affected her poetry. And for Shariar, um, how was your travel personally affected your last, or the difference, I should say, between your last two books? You had just been um, here in the US for a couple of years when censoring came out, and now you've been here much longer. Um, you write so beautifully about memory uh, and how it's affected by censorship. And just from your reading now, it seems like the sort of um, memory seems affected both by a sense of the sacred and by war and trauma, obviously. So how has travel affected um, the last, uh, you know, eight, 12 years of your writing uh, in general and also specifically your writing about memory? Thank you. It's always going to be me. Uh, <laughs> uh, Marie, that's, um, so the question referred to a travel log that Furuk had um, composed while she went um, she had traveled extensively through Europe after her divorce. I actually chose not to write about that period of her life at all, uh, which you can do in a novel. <laughs> uh, and the reason is I, I really wanted to keep 
the, the novel focused very tightly on Furuk's life in Iran and on her identity as an Iranian. So I think that trip to Europe was incredibly formative to her, both as an artist and as a woman. Uh, I think she was transformed by it. But the novel really skips over that and, and focuses. I want to justify it a bit by saying that, I, I can't entirely justify that, but, um, but I would say that I, um, I'm so fascinated by the fact that Furu chose to, to live in Iran, to stay in Iran, because she had opportunity to leave. This is, of course, decades before the Islamic Revolution, but I think Iran was deeply uncomfortable for her, and she would have had all the reason in the world to leave, and she chose not to. And that's something that I think maybe particularly because my family chose to leave, I've always looked at those who didn't leave, and I've been so touched by that decision. And I think that for Furur, while she she really was a woman of the world and how she thought, she, she really had an intelligence and a brilliance that spanned the world. And she read so broadly. She, she was reading T.S. Eliot. She was reading Bernard Shaw. Um, that she was also always and forever Iranian. And she, she stayed in Iran, um, I think, with, um, with all the reason in the world not to stay. And part of, um, part of the last section of the book, I, I use quotations of Furu in which she says, you know, well, whatever Iran is, you know, Iran essentially, Iran has warped me. Iran has um, shriveled me, but it is my country and, um, and I love it and I won't leave it. And so, um, and so I think the travel was very important, but so too were the roots that she refused to pull up in her native land. Uh first year that I came to the United States, it was supposed that I just stay for nine months. I had a fellowship at Brown University, a wonderful university at the East Coast, Rhode Island. And I was walking at that little city named Providence and thinking about, okay, what, you, what I'm going to write. And thinking, thinking, thinking. I, I felt that something is changing in my mind and environment was changed. No censorship, no fear, no threat. And one day it came to my mind, the idea of writing a, censor, a, a short story about censorship in Iran. I was happy because when I was writing that, uh, there, was, there wasn't, I didn't have any scare or fear that suddenly at night, midnight, there would be a storm to my house and they storm to my house and got my computer and everything that I have and took everything and arresting something like it. So I started writing that novel. And it was helpful. I found out that I am going to adapt myself to this situation. I have to. And also, I, I believe in that there is a country in, uh, in, in the world named um, the literature country. There's no, no uh, differences between Iranian writer, American writer, or <coughs> Latin American writers. If we are talking about literature, not about uh, a sort of uh, bestseller books like Daniel Steele books, something like that, real literature, or pure literature. Uh, they are living in a country named literature country. And uh, so easily I could find some good friends, writers, poets in America, and we had good uh, <coughs> conversation with them and trading our experiences. And I tried to learn more English language and not to write. I never 
try to write in English literature because the prose that I have, it is what I have in this world, in Farsi language. So I prefer to write in Farsi and then, sorry, sitting over there. <laughs> her, her heart is <laughs> beating so what? How many pages it would be? Um, how much dog it would be? <laughs> In this novel, in this uh, Moonbrow, there are two kinds of prose. The right angel, right uh, in a sort of slang uh, prose. The, the, the left angel. The right one, right in a sort of, sort of archaic Persian language, and a little bit poetic. So it was a hard job that she did and appreciated it. Anyway, writing it now all, you would write it and you finish it and then, yeah, you miss your characters, the characters that you live with them. It is now all nine years I was living with them. <coughs> Want to add something? In a way, I think of translators as sort of the ultimate travelers, too, and I always wish I could be a, a, a translator. I mean, I've, I've actually tried to, uh, years and years ago, that me? I don't know who that was. Years and years ago, they tried to get me to translate some of Furul Farahsad's poetry, and my brother and I sat for days, and we tried to improve upon it. It was, it was crazy to imagine how translators worked. But do you feel that? I mean, to just extend that travel question to you, do you feel like you get to inhabit lots of bodies and places, and is that part of the drive for you? It's not so much as traveling. It's embodying the writer. And each writer, personalities are different, thought processor, processes are different, their approach to literature is different, their approach to their narrative is different, um, and that's not even discussing style and structure and syntax and all of that. So uh, what is primarily a challenge for me is first being able to think and to feel what he's thinking and feeling when he's writing those words down. Because if I can't think like him, if I can't feel what he's feeling when he's writing it, there's no way I could translate it. I, I could translate it word by word, but it won't be his voice. It won't be a reflection of him. It'll be a reflection of me. As a translator, I find my job is primarily to be absolutely invisible. When you read this in English, there should be no sign of me in there. It should be only him. So I find that to be the voyage, let's say. I have so much to say. Sorry, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. This is, this is so great. Sorry. I think the question right here. Yes, for Ms. Darsnik. Thank you for the panel, actually. Um, but uh, did you also uh, study other uh, books around uh, that uh, period of time, or you just referred to the... Yes. Uh, did you also study uh, literature about that time uh, that you were writing your novel about? or you just refer to your family experience about, or your mother, for example, um, to, to go be, uh, on the imaginative road that you took for uh, for folk, right? Um, so the question is if I had, um, if I researched the novel or if I drew primarily from my family's experience or oral history, um, the novel is, is deeply researched and um, it was really, it came out of, um, it came out of years of study. I started as a literary scholar, and I had written um, part of my dissertation about Furu, and I had I had read a lot of Iranian literature um, in the course of that uh, that degree. So I felt um, I really it it was very useful in a sense because I was saturating my mind. Anything I could get novels, films, poetry, I was saturating my mind and my mind and my mind, and um, and that was because. Uh, I wanted to create a world that felt real because that's the kind of novel I like. I like to sink into a novel and feel like I am there. I'm in that world. So unfortunately, that doesn't come. You know, it doesn't for me. It, at least it doesn't come without a lot of the, that that 
that period of saturating my mind with um, the secondary m materials. Uh, but there's a certain point where you have to cut loose from that because it gets, um, you know, it can, it can really also stifle your creativity. And also, I mean, frankly, it's so much more fun to research than it is to write. <laughs> you know, writing is, I, I, would, I would still be researching if I could because I, I, love, I love that part of it. But at a certain point, you have to untether yourself from what is and jump into what isn't. And that's your, your mind, scary place. And, um, and so, um, and so that's, that's what I had to do at a certain point is I had to cut myself loose from anything um, available to me from the outside and go deep inside into the unknown of my mind. Had another question somewhere. Yes. Here. Publisher. Um, ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Nathan. I'm with Rethus Books. We publish Moonbrow. Thank you, Sharia and Sarah, very much. Um, so I uh, read the book all the way through and was asking some uh, dumb elementary questions to Sarah and Sharia. Um, not realizing that Moonbrow uh, is a Persian folktale. Um, it comes from, and Sarah told me it's sort of a cousin to what Americans know as Cinderella. And I wonder, Sharyar, if you could talk a little about, bit about the folktales that are woven throughout the novel and how you came to weave them in and what they, you know, um, what that meant to you as you built it into the book. First of all, I didn't know the end of the novel. You know, and I don't want to reveal it. Uh, mm, yeah, it is about a young officer at his army services that he lost his uh, left hand. And at home, and after years he got back home, he always dreamed of nightmares about putting a ring to the finger of a girl. But I couldn't see her face. So, uh, because of uh, um, the shock of bomb or shock of mortal um, shell, he lost a part of his memory as well. So he's looking for it that, that year in his past. This was the uh, main idea of the book. But I didn't know when I was writing, I didn't know, I didn't want to know that if uh, he could find the ring on the bones of, uh, on, on the bone of his hand or not. He decided to get back to the front line, in the mountain that he was after <coughs> war uh, was ended, and to find uh, the bones of his left hand, to see if there is a ring over there or not. I didn't know it, I, and I didn't want to know it. I just wanted to make a, a sort of this uh, journey, a sort of uh, odyssey for him to start from Tehran to uh, best part of uh, uh, west part of Iran, the mountain. I had a good time with it, with writing it. There are times that I feel that he's telling his story. Uh, in opposite of what I have planned for it. I like these scenes in my novels. In one of my novels that maybe it couldn't be translated because of Rose. Uh, <coughs> I had a character named uh, Kakai, a simple man, a naive man that he went to the war after uh, <coughs> losing his love or failing. And at that novel, each character is somehow uh, um, Somehow it's uh, re related to one of the essence, one of the uh, four essence of the world. Uh, one of them is uh, wind, one of them is water, one of them is 
dirt. Cocoa is a dirt. And it was the plan of my novel that he goes to the front line and then they arrest him, Iraqi's army arrest him, and after years he come back as a good man, as a experienced man, as a hero, to help the woman, his, his love. And the woman, because of it, because I, I, I knew that I will have a sort of good, happy ending novel. So I make many, many tragic scenes for that woman. <laughs> to make a sort of good saving for a hero. <laughs> so all the plot of novel was that, like, at the middle of the novel, in a, in a, in a um, fight, in the war, Kakai start uh, to have a sort of a stream of consciousness. And he start to curse the dirt, the ground, the earth what he was from. Every, every time that he was going to somewhere new, he tasted uh, the dirt of that new place. And I was shocked. He was cursing, 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 cursing. And uh, yeah, pee on you. Uh, they, they put uh, mines in you and you didn't say anything. They, uh, they grabbed the um, bodies, nameless bodies in you, and you didn't say anything. They explode bombs on, on you, and you didn't, you didn't say anything. Pee on you, pee on you, I and mean, something like that. And I found out that he is going to die. It was supposed that when he got injured, he was wounded, an Iraqi soldier comes uh, to him and arrest him, and they take him to the Iraq, and then after ending the love war, he would be released. But when the Iraqi soldier came uh, on, the, on the top of his head and asked him, uh, stand up, he started cursing to an Iraqi soldier as well. Bad words. And so he killed him. The novel is about 900 pages. I was uh, at the page of 15, 500. And I lost my hero. <laughs> I didn't know how to finish the novel. <laughs> it takes a few months for me to, to find out what should I do. And then I will. This is the way that I like it. When the character stands in, uh, in front of you and uh, um, force you to write as he wants, it means that th that character is alive in your novel. This said, I think it was Balzac at one time. Uh, a friend of him came to his room and found out him so frustrated and nervous and asked him, what's wrong with you, Walzak? He said, what, 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 what a F word? This Nancy, his character, she wasn't supposed to get married, but he is, she's going to get married in this novel. I don't want it. This is the way that characters live in their novels. <laughs> Translator conference here with the uh, artist. No, I like this. This is good. Yeah, no, please. This is good. Yeah, yeah I forgot that part of the question. <laughs> the myths. <laughs> the myth. I was waiting, but I like the other. <laughs> when somebody asked me, uh, which, writers, uh, are you, which writers are you influenced by them, I said, don't ask this question from the writers because they lie to you. And they give you uh, stories and uh, stories and uh, stories. <laughs> so I give you some uh, stories. Uh, the um, the old tale, the tales of Iranian tales, they are so wonderful. And they are not translated in uh, um, English language or other languages. And uh, <coughs> actually, after uh, Islamic Revolution, they are not interested in these kind of tales. Uh, because they are, um, at last, there is a princess in it, or there is a prince in it, and there is a um, castle, and if uh, grandmother talking about the beast, 
maybe mullahs think that these are them, and so they censor it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I found out a sort of literary second layer in those tales. And I used them in my novel. I, I brought a part of them in my novel, uh, not all of them. And uh, it is a sort of maybe mm, hypertext or mm, intertext, something like that, uh, mm, to use a part of those terms and get their meaning or get their uh, beauties and try to use that beauty, beauty in your novel. Beautiful. Do we have time for another? Can we? Can we one more maybe? And then, and then, yeah, you can get your book signed and talk to. Uh, I was, in, I saw a hand earlier somewhere. Do we? Yeah. Hello. Um, this is a question for the translator. Um, are there some things that you just can't translate into English? Uh, yes, there are. Um, <laughs> I'll give you an example. N not many, I have to say. Surprisingly, um, the Farsi language, regardless of how complicated the prose are being used, it amazingly lends itself to translation. Um, not easily, but it does. However, there are, um, I'll give you an example. There's a word in the Farsi language, on. On in its most simple meaning means that. Now, on also has many other meanings and implications and um, a, a lot of it mystical, poetic, references, inferences. And there was a paragraph in the novel in which Shahriar had used the word on repeatedly, several times in each sentence, in an entire paragraph. But in each instance, he had used it with a different meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, for me to find one word in the English, and it was very much, uh, it, it had the rhythm of poetry. Now, there was no way that I could find one word in the English language that I could repeat as many times as Shariar did with that many different meanings encompassed within that word that would actually make sense in English. I would have to, instead of on, use a two or three word phrase to elucidate that inference. However, then that paragraph would lose all its poetic nature, it would lose its rhyme, it would lose its music. So we went back and forth about on. And many of its um, meanings, he actually had to spend hours explaining them to me. Uh, and that paragraph, I, I think I worked on that paragraph for at least three weeks. And finally, we decided to just leave it in a very diluted form, and as diluted as was possible, and we sent the manuscript in, and the first question from Nathan was, Sarah, I don't get this. <laughs> so so we've, we finally had to do away with it. So yes, there are things that just simply cannot be translated. It's very frustrating uh, speaking English when you have a mind that speaks Farsi because there's just so many other and longer ways, as you can see when we talk. You know, there's so many words that I can never substitute and I need, yeah. It's, yeah, yes. I do hope that this book will be published in Farsi, yes? Why not? Which oh. one? <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, mine? Yes. No, no, I don't think so. Why? <laughs> they can't, uh, they can't bear it, they can't. Uh, it is about uh, the narrators or angels, it is about uh, 
the narrators of. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm thinking not in Iran. I would like no, to. No, I didn't mean it. I know not in Iran. I know yeah. that's not possible. I yeah, maybe. Yeah. Outside. Yeah, outside. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Because it sounds like. I will like put it in Amazon after. Four <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's too precious to waste. Yeah. Not in the Iranian language. From what you're. No, obviously. Yeah. Iran's publishing world is currently very chaotic. I mean, they will be, they translate things all the time and, and illegally all the time. I mean, but then mean sometimes it puts it. You mean published? You mean published? Yes, yes, in Iran too. And sometimes it can put a target on someone's back. Oh, I know. All and that. it, yeah, so there's a whole weird chaotic thing, and sanctions have added a whole other dimension to it. And so certain American authors don't even know that they're being translated in, in Iran. And sometimes it's a wonderful and a pleasure, but sometimes it can cause all sorts of problems. No, I mean, there must be expatriate publishers for Iranian literature. Every day less and less. Yeah. Some of the greatest, like, I don't know if you're familiar with what happened in Ketab Corp in, in Los Angeles. So No, what happened? Uh, oh. It's disbanded. Oh. It's gone. So it's uh, just, what did we just say, four, four to six months ago probably? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's in the last year. So, yeah, it's unfortunately, it's not a thriving industry at all. It's very sad. And hopefully it will change. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about to put it in somewhere like a site like Amazon. But the problem is that uh, Iranian people, Iranian particularly young people in Iran, they don't have a credit card. Credit card. Yeah. Okay, most of them, most of them can <laughs> read in English, but I'm thinking about uh, my readers in Iran. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you. <laughs> a lot of us, I mean, send Word documents to, there's a lot of students who've written me over the last years who need books after sanctions and are desperate. So I've literally sent them PDFs and Word docs, and I have to like control how they. It's a whole song and dance, but it's quite. It's a, it's a sort of desperate situation. You have to see who you trust, and then you have to talk to other writers, and it's it's a chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and all of us have relatives everywhere, you know, in there and there. So it's like, how do you manage this question? It's a really difficult one, actually. We're in the midst of it, I think. Um, you know, may I add something? Yeah. It's, 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 I hope that, I, lo I love it, it is my uh, proud, it's my honor to see my literature, my stories in my language, in Farsi words. So, censoring I couldn't do it, but about this book maybe I can, to publish it in Farsi. You know, uh, it, it, uh, when censoring came out, there was a translation of it in um, South Korea. And they sent me a copy of the book. I was watching it, and you know, this side I have to read, this side I have to read. And I, I thought, as a joke, how can I know that the translator published his novel yeah. instead of mine, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, watching and seeing your uh, novel in your mother language, it is. It is such a great uh, <laughs> pleasure, honor. So I will do it. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine, has yours been at all translate either of your books, or have you seen that happen with any of your work, or do you have desires in that direction? You know, if it's happened, it, word hasn't gotten to me, <laughs> and it is like you say, it's a it's a compliment in a sense. Yeah. Um, Though, it, you know, you'd be surprised what selling in Iran. I read at, at a certain point the most um, popular book in Iran was Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. <laughs> you know, I mean, so Iran's, um, Iran's literary culture is very vibrant, but they also have an appetite for American books and, and so forth. So, But, um, you know, it, and, and with this book in particular, with um, Song of a Captive Bird, I mean, I feel like in, in a sense it, it belongs in Iran because Furug is so important to Iranians and so it's heartbreaking to think of um, 
you know, that not happening. Um, I think I worry. I don't. I don't have such a wonderful translator. I, how did you find? I don't. I, I have to ask him later, because <laughs> I want one too. <laughs> you know, it's really. So I think as a writer, that you worry about just a bad translate. I don't mind. You know, I would happily give it to um, a publisher in Iran, but not having control over the translation because we labor so hard to get the words just right, and and so it's a little scary to um, to hand it over. Um, yeah, it's it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's 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 deeply heartbreaking that the most natural audience for my book um, has no way of accessing it. There may be st students in Iran, the most wonderful students on earth, in my opinion, yeah. are doing lots of amazing work, and connecting us to them is maybe the best way, rather yeah. than the most more commercial ways. But they are constantly hungry for those opportunities, and they write all the time and now that they can get around the proxy servers and all that with like Twitter and all that, they, I get a lot of interesting messages. So continue, I mean, one great lesson I think we can take from this is like continue supporting literature, um, continue supporting Iranian literature too. It's got a very long and vibrant history and it continues to live. It is in no way endangered in spite of all sorts of things like we could say like sanctions and things like that. It's, it's a very much a living form and we are out there um, and it's an honor to even share that label with these wonderful people here. Um, I really hope that you will buy these books. They are Bessiar Ziba. They're stunning, absolutely beautiful books. Translation? Yeah. They're very beautiful. Very beautiful. <laughs> um, and, and yes, and look them up. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of work here, too. I mean, I, I am all amazed also by how much Sara has done, too, for us in bringing all these writers to this language. So these are our great heroes. Buy their books, sign, get their your books signed, chat, and continue to create this dialogue and to create the need so that this will, will leave this room on, onwards. Th big round of applause for these people.